Hi guys, welcome to this Happen GPS onboarding video. We're gonna walk you through some of the key things that are gonna allow you to have a really successful implementation. Now, the first thing we wanna take a look at is getting this application and mobile app installed. And we're gonna click on the App Store in order to do that. And we're going to search for Happen, that's H-A-P-N. It's gonna push you to Happen GPS, which the second listing, the first non-sponsored listing is us. That's the Happen logo. And it will say install if you don't already have it installed. Once you click, you're gonna be given the option of logging in or signing up. If you have not gone through activation, it is vital that you go through the sign up at this point, although typically you will be pre-activated. Now, we will have some credentials, an email, and a password. You're going to log in with your credentials right here. And you can also enable things like Face ID here if you wish to do that. For Android, you can enable the Touch ID as well. Um, I like Face ID, so I'm going to enable that. And we're going to log in. And we are greeted with all of our trackers on the app in a nice, clean cluster. And right away, this is how you're going to use the platform. Now, diving into the actual web application, you can see the trackers, like I mentioned, they are nested together. And then we've got a tracker list down at the bottom. Now, when you first log in, you might see that you have trackers that say they have no tracking information available, like this one right here, 6259. Do not worry, that just means this tracker hasn't connected to either the cell network or the GPS network and sent us data. You can simply take it for a short little 10 minute drive, 10 minute walk, even even set it by a window and it will connect and get that information to our platform. Now, once that happens, once that tracker is on the platform, you can then click on it. I click on that listing right there and I am following this device. This is a, a device that is being set to motion. It's not actually moving, but this is what it looks like when a device is traveling down the road. This one, 53 miles per hour. You can see the pulsing on the icon and that's how you know it's moving and we can simply follow it. If we click up at the top and go to tracker settings, we can go into reporting modes. And reporting modes are how fast that tracker updates. This one is set to every five seconds, but we've got several options. Actually, we're going to click into the normal mode now, which is gonna make it update every minute when it's moving and every three hours when it's stopped. That's gonna give us a bit more balanced data. And it's gonna ask if I wanna do the switch and I'm gonna say, yes, I would like to do the switch. Now, this does happen over the air. So you're gonna have a pop-up that's gonna prevent you from making other changes. And it's going, it's there to ensure that you're, that the, the shift actually happens. And just like that, we are complete. You can see we've now got the blue check mark next to normal mode. So that's how fast you can actually change these settings. I didn't have to call support, nothing like that. Now, if I go back into the tracker settings, we can actually take a quick look at some of the things that we also have here, some additional settings. We've got settings for active hours where we can create the value, network mode for if we're traveling internationally, updating the odometer, virtual ignition sensitivity, and some information about the tracker. It's all, it's all really, really valuable, really, really vital. Now let's take a look at an alternate way to be able to get into that follow mode that we mentioned, seeing it on the map, watching it while it moves. Well, if we click into our clusters, each time we click, it'll dig us in deeper. And now we can finally see our tracker, California 1112233 that we're following. And if we click on that tracker's icon, we are now locked into that tracker and we will follow it as it moves. And that card at the bottom also has some really vital data. You can see its status, when its last update was, the current location, a bit of information about the odometer and active hours, that statistics. So a lot of really vital, valuable information in one quick and easy place. Okay, guys, now let's dive in, actually, and let's take a look at the web application, which is another piece of this puzzle that we're going to be taking a look at. So now that we've taken a look at the mobile app, we can now dig into the web application, which is located at app.gethappen.com. You'll log in with those same credentials that we set up for the mobile app, and you'll be greeted with this screen when you land. Now this screen is the exact same, basically, as what you see on the mobile app. We've got the main map reflecting the most recent known locations with our clusters of devices. And then we've got our matching tracker list on the left that was along the bottom in the mobile app. In fact, if we click on one of the trackers, we'll actually follow that exact same device that we were doing on the mobile app as well. Now we're gonna X out of this follow mode. We're gonna hit resume down in the bottom corner to reset. And we're gonna focus on four key administration tasks that you're able to do on the web app that are gonna to lead to a successful implementation for you. 
So if I click up here in the top left corner, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new boundary. Boundaries are very vital because what they allow you to do is get information about a very specific point on the map and allow you to, in essence, get notified anytime a tracker enters or exits that spot. It's great for things like theft protection. It's also very good just to keep tabs on what's going on with your business as assets may be moved to a new rental location. So if I click the big green create a new boundary, you can see that we're taken to a large boundary. I'm actually going to change the color really quickly to red so we can get a bit of a better view of it. A large circular boundary. Circular boundaries are going to be beneficial if you're trying to do something at scale. Make sure guys stay in a certain city, something like that. Typically, we're going to recommend doing a custom shape boundary by clicking right there. Then when we zoom in, we can actually draw a boundary around a very specific location if we need to. Every time we click, it'll put a new point on the map. So you can be as precise or as rough-handed as you need to. And when we click back on the first point, it will close the boundary and give us a custom shape boundary around that spot. We can then add the name, put in the address if we want to get it into a specific centered location. But once we click save, the boundary, it's going to ask us yes if we're sure, and it's going to say if we want to create another one. We're going to say no, that's the only one we need. Well, now we have that new boundary. It will be in the map right here. If we scroll down, we've got several that are named a new boundary, but this is the one that we just created in Houston, Texas. Well, now we're going to get notifications every time a tracker enters or exits this spot on the map. It's a super handy way to be able to get that data. Now, the next thing we're going to take a look at, we're going to head back to the home page first. Then we're going to go up to the top left corner and we're going to go, or top right corner, pardon me, and we're going to go to our settings to adjust our alerts and notifications. Now, we have a large list of alerts and notifications. I'm not going to go through the whole list. You'll be able to see them as we scroll through and you'll be able to see them on your application. But you're able to uh, turn these alerts on individually. I've got all of these on Do Not Disturb right now, but if we turn that off, you see there is a master checkbox for each alarm, each alert. You can turn them off one at a time. You can turn them back on. You can also configure how you get notified, either via mobile, which is a push notification on your mobile device, via web, which is a pop-up in your browser window, via text message, or via email. Um, again, this is a lot of valuable information coming to you. Some of the basic ones, the most popular ones, are speeding alerts. You set the speed, it will tell you when the tracker exceeds that. Uh, low battery, which is when you're using our asset trackers or power, battery powered devices, you get notifications when you need to charge that, um, that battery. Then we've got our boundary entry and exit notifications for the boundary that we just set up. Um, enabling these are gonna allow you to maximize that new boundary that you just created. Um, and then we've got the SOS button, which the some of our battery powered devices have a physical button that if you press it, you can send a notification. Now, there are a lot more around things like um, active hours and odometer counts, when a device has disconnected, when the ignition on a device is triggered, so that way you know when your car is being started or your piece of equipment is being turned on. There's a lot of va valuable information here that you can really tailor to your implementation. Now, I am a big fan of being very picky and choosy about these because you want to be careful and you want to make sure you don't get overloaded with too many notifications. You know, if you're deploying a large number of trackers and you enable every alert with a very aggressive schedule, so a lower speed threshold or a higher battery threshold, for example, you might get hit with so many notifications that it makes it unwieldy to try to use. So be a little choosy, pick and choose which ones you want, and that's how to make sure you have a very successful implementation of alerts and notifications. Okay, now the next thing that we want to head over to, we're gonna go back to the preferences menu with the gear icon in the top right, and we're gonna head to users. Now this is where we invite and create new users to our platform. These are people that are not the build users. These can be customers. These can be other employees that they're going to have access to your Happen implementation, and they're going to be able to really dig in and do the work as well. So if we hit invite user in the top right corner, we have to enter an email address. We're going to use a very fancy one called tj at mail.com. I am tj, by the way. And uh, we do have to put the dot com. Then we're going to be able to select the role. So we've got two options right now, admin and collaborator. 
admin allows the user to do any role that's available and collaborators are more of a read-only account. They can change things, but only change that changes that affect their view. Um, they're not able to change things like tracker names or billing information or anything like that. And when we select the role, we're actually given a few other additional options. We can allow access to all trackers or very specific trackers. If we click limited access, you can then go through and individually tell it which trackers they're able to see. They will not know that the trackers that you don't select even exist. So this is great if you need to add a customer who has rented maybe four to five pieces of equipment. They're only ever gonna see those four to five pieces of equipment in the application. So it's very handy. It's a very good way to allow that access. Then we also have the ability to limit access to historical activity. Um, this is again great for use with customers because let's say you rent out a um, generator to someone and then you get it back, you've got it going back out on rent three or four days later. Well, the new customer, you don't want them to see the rental history, you don't want them to see who was using it last. So you're able to limit that tracker history by date, which is a very, very handy way to ensure that you're keeping your data clean when you're sharing it with customers. Now the collaborator role, it has the exact same options with the additional option of allowing uh, them to see or not see and use boundaries. Um, this can be vital, it depends on who's using the platform. Um, typically I'm going to, if I'm inviting a customer, you're gonna invite them as a collaborator and you're gonna not give them access to boundaries, but then you might have some customers who need the access. All admins will have access to boundaries. That is one thing to keep in mind. Um, and then you simply hit invite user and the user themselves will go through the process of getting an email. They'll go through the same account creation that you went through when you started. Then they're able to log in with their own credentials nice and easily. Now, the last thing that we wanna talk about here on the um, web application is viewing reporting. Our reporting tools are available on the web application. If we go into reports, you'll see that we've got several different options here. We've got alerts which is going to show you all the alerts generated by devices, boundary activity, tracker activities, which is all your trips and stops, tracker positions, which is the sort of deep dive, million grains of sand on a beach report, which is every position generated by the trackers. It's a very robust report. It's really useful for investigating specific incidents. Then we've got tracker usage, which shows all the usage data being generated by your trackers. That's gonna be active hours and things of that nature. Then we've got detailed tracker usage, which allows you to view that information uh, in a more granular form, more hour by hour, that sort of thing. Now we're gonna wait for this tracker usage report to load. Um, these reports are a lot of data being aggregated into a spreadsheet type of thing. And here we are, we're taking a look at this listing. We're actually gonna focus on that tracker California 1112233 because that's the device we've been looking at throughout the mobile and web app. And as you can see, on this one day, we had one active day, so the tracker was active. It was active for 0.19 total hours, so it did not move a ton, but it was active a little bit, and you can see our starting and ending count is about the same. You can see the days moving, one, you can see the total moving hours, the distance covered, and the odometer count ticking up. So this is, I like to call it the back of the baseball card, where you're able to view the statistics about a tracker in a nice, clean, easy place. Okay, guys, that's it for this rough and ready, uh, quick uh, intro into the Happen applications. We're really happy to have you, and these are just some of the things that you need to get started and get successful. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching, and take care.